Welcome to part 3 of the Dahomey Kingdom and its Amazons. I'm your host, Afrostorian, and today we are going to talk about the fall of the Dahomey Kingdom. Disclaimer, this podcast is meant for ages 13 and up. This podcast contains subjects such as war, slavery, and death. Viewer discretion, or rather, listener discretion, is advised. Chapter 7 The Final Decades of Dahomey With the support of Dezusa, Hezo had no issue managing to get all of Adandozan's enemies to rally behind him. And thus, civil war ensued. By 1818, Kessel was victorious in the civil war, and accounts differ on what happened to Adandozan. Some sources speculate execution, others house arrest. However, much like a Hangbe before him, efforts were made to try and wipe Adandozan from history. Part of this was to execute all of the Amazons loyal to Adandozan. However, we know that Adandozan engaged in a lot of correspondence with the European powers. A lot of these documents can be found today in museums in France, Portugal, Britain, and Brazil, outlining that despite how Jesu tried to malign Adandozan, he attempted to bring the fledgling Industrial Revolution to Dahomey and improve the kingdom's agricultural output, seeing where the winds were starting to blow regarding the transatlantic slave trade. A lot of the Dahomey accounts of Adandozan that actually do survive to this day appear to have been penned by Jezo and thus portray him in an excessively cartoonish way as a villain. Hezo then claimed a large portion of the positive reforms that Adandozan had enacted as part of his own plan to raise his own importance in Dahomey history. Hezo was not a fan of the long tributary status that Dahomey had towards Oyo. Dahomey would get some windfall as the Oyo would have their attention mainly focused on a threat that was covering most of West Africa, the Fulani Jihads. In the area that would become Nigeria specifically, the Fulani had conquered the Hausa kingdoms to form the Fulani Sokoto Caliphate, which was expanding rapidly south, forcing the weakened Oyo Empire on the defensive. By 1820, Hezo officially ended Dahomey's tribute to Oyo, even going so far as to execute the envoys sent by Oyo. Oyo then sent a massive force that it could spare, expecting as usual to crush Dahomey as it had done in the past for a century. Things would turn out differently this time for the Oyo. By this time, the Amazon forces and the main military forces had modernized significantly due to trade deals with merchants like De Sousa. From one account, it seems that updated munitions were able to render the infamous Oyo cavalry null and void during a large battle 
in 1823. Liu response after this defeat was to use one of its allies in the region to help subjugate the Homi while it could focus on the Fulani forces in the north, the Mahi Kingdom. There were two major battles in this new Dahomey Mahi War. The first campaign battle occurred at the town of Huin Roto, which defeated the Dahomey. Hezo would redouble his efforts in bolstering the ranks of the Amazons by incorporating more female citizens into this armed group. Then marching against the Mahi at the Battle of Paungnan, which ended in the Homi victory in 1828. By 1830, with the Mahi forces thoroughly occupying the Dahomey and keeping them at a stalemate, Oyo decided to send an invasion force 4,000 strong to attack the Dahomey. Hezo was not prepared to fight this force head on, so Hezo conducted a night raid on the Oyo forces. The surprise attack caused the death of the general and routing of the Oyo forces. The Oyo retreated and focused more on supporting the Mahi kingdom in their conflict against the Dahomey. As Hezo was unable to score significant military victories against the Mahi that would effectively crush them, he had to sell some of his own citizens into slavery, which did not go over well with the citizens of the kingdom. Even by 1839, the war against the Mahi was still ongoing. While he was expending his forces against the Mahi, a small town near the Oyo border had come to power and was becoming a haven that did not want to be part of the slave trade, which allowed it increased trade with the British Empire, which was pushing even harder for the end of slavery. This was the town of Abeokuta. Abeokuta had natural borders that acted as anti-army defenses. A large river and being surrounded by large rocky formations that would have forced invading armies to narrow the profile of their army. Dahomey would try on occasion in the 1840s to attack Abeokuta multiple times and had multiple failures due to these natural barriers. But he still had to focus on the Mahi War, which was still ongoing even by 1850. One of the most notable battles against the Mahi in the 1850s was the Second Battle of Attack Palme in 1850. Attack Palme was a city north of Abomi that had a population mixture of both Mahi and Yoruba citizens, and though the city was smaller, it had several defensive forts that kept the Dahomey army at bay since 1840. Hezo launched a massive campaign to take the city in 1850 but several of his male and female generals argued about how best to take the city. In the end, the male generals opted for a frontal assault, which led to high casualties for the male troops. The battle would have ended in a rout if not for Amazon General Sedong Hongbe, who used the male retreat to wrap around the attack Palme forces that were in pursuit, encircling them with her smaller units and cutting them down. Though a lot of citizens had escaped, it was a Dahomey victory, and encouraged Hezo to focus his efforts 
on putting more resources into raising the quality of his army. The Oryo Kingdom's ability to retaliate was faltering, and by 1836, it suffered an internal collapse, losing several of its territories under Fulani aggression. While the kingdom would officially end in 1896, as a major power, it was completely gone by 1836, which exposed a lot of its former territories to the Dahomey, which appeared to have retained a lot of resentment at being forced to be a tributary state. One example of this was the Battle of Inubi in 1841. Inubi was a town that was within the former borders of the Oyo Empire, but close to Dahomey. Hezo marshaled his forces not to capture the citizens, but to massacre the entire populace successfully and seize all of their plantations. Hezo was taking advantage of the remnants of the Oyo Empire splitting into their own small kingdoms and factions, which made them much easier to deal with. In 1845, the Eba, a Yoruba subgroup, were attacking another Yoruba subgroup known as the Egbado. The Egbado ruler sent a request to Hezo for help, and in retaliation, the Eba tried to preemptively attack Hezo's forces before they could relieve the beleaguered Egbado. The Eba managed to catch Hezo and his Amazons unaware near the village of Imojulu. The major male forces were killed, but the Amazons managed to take out a large chunk of the Eba forces before they themselves were overrun. Hezo managed to escape, holding a massive funeral for the Amazons, but his personal and religious honor was now called into question with the capture of his religious and royal regalia. The royal regalia was an umbrella, colorful, sporting colors such as red, white, and some colors that have no proper equivalent being a mix. This was the royal umbrella, the symbol of Dahomey power, which the Eba burned after its capture. In response, Hezo raised a much more massive army, and instead of the Amazons being an elite military unit to be used as a reserve shock unit, up to 5,000 Amazons were marshaled into several battalions that were now seen as superior to the male units due to their armament and training. Hezo would become incensed when the Agbado signed a peace agreement with Yeba in 1847, adding insult to injury. This made his new target, the Egbado town of Okiadon, in 1848. The strategy employed was to make it seem as if the army, as usual, was going to head to Abeokuta which lowered the guard of the citizens of Okiadon. The army then turned around and sacked Okiadon, selling 4,000 of its citizens to D'Souza, enough that D'Souza needed several of his ships just to transport all those slaves. A lot of the other citizens had their skulls put on display on the road to Okiadon as a reminder to not renege on alliances with the Dahomey. The Eba fought on behalf of their ally, destroying several Dahomey towns, and Hezo marshaled a massive force in 1851 to attack Abeokuta with 16,000 male troops and 4,000 Amazons. The leader of the town of Ishaga and several British missionaries 
warn the Aba of the Dahomey advance, allowing for the preparation of a robust defense. Hezo, unaware of the sabotage by Ishaga, marched on Abeokuta. The defenses of Abeokuta consisted of 15,000 male troops, but the citizens, numbering 50,000, were also invited to join the fighting, being provided munitions by British envoys and allowing them to fire upon the invading Dahomey forces on March 3rd, 1851. Initially, the battle was straightforward. The forces of Abeokuta streamed out to meet the Dahomey, making the battle largely close quarters combat. Several divisions of the Dahomey military took positions adjacent to the defending forces and fired on them, forcing a quick retreat back to the city walls. The Dahomey split their forces into two, trying to probe Abeokuta for weaknesses. The city walls and the defenses were heavily fortified, and the winds started to blow the gunpowder smoke from both sides downwind of the Dahomey, creating a large smoky fog that was starting to create chaos in the ranks. The Abeokuta used this to their advantage and pushed back the Dahomey forces all the way back to Ishaga. The Ishaga forces were able to pincer the Dahomey forces, catching Hezo between the two armies. Hezo would never have the military capacity to make large moves like this again, instead making small raids into towns like Ekpo in order to create a slave caste to manage the farms and industry as the numerous wars and losses had caused a large depopulation crisis. Hezo was continuing to lose support domestically as well as internationally. He needed the support of the British Empire if the Dahomey were to prevail, and thus he decided to comply with the British urging to end the slave trade by 1852. This provided increased trade with Britain, but increased factionalism within the kingdom, as those whose income was centered in the slave trade focused their efforts now on deposing Herzl or forcing him to resume the slave trade. While ending the slave trade, Hezo focused more on the palm oil trade, which was starting to get a lot more lucrative for the Dahomey kingdom. Still smarting from the defeats by Eba forces, he made another assault on Ekpo in 1858. While Hezo's forces were successful in wiping out the Eba forces stationed at Ekpo, Hezo would be wounded during the battle, and then caught smallpox, leading to his death in 1858. This left the throne to his son Glele. Glele had plans to strike against Ishaga, but he needed the economic ability to wage war. This allowed for renewed trade agreements in the palm oil business, with the French. The end of the slave trade by this point meant that Clele did not have to deal with de Sousa as much as his father did by 1860. Two years later, after building up the armed forces, the homies sacked the town of Ishaga on March 1862. Then they went for the town of Ibarra, close to Abeokuta, in 1863. Clele was confident that he could succeed in taking Abeokuta and raise himself higher than his father in the eyes of the public. In 1864, he marched with an army of 12,000 in a forced march towards Abeokuta. 
The forced march exhausted the Dahomey forces, making it easy for the Abeokuta defense to easily rout their long-time foe. While spurned at Abeokuta, Khele turned his ambitions of expansion towards Mahi and Grand Popo, making successive attacks against them in 1869. He turned his ambitions to the Uweme people as his ancestors had done once before in the 1870s. By this time, a new European power was making envoys to Dahomey to build firms and encourage trade. This new power was Germany. And by the 1880s, several factories were established in Dahomey after Hlele successfully sacked the Yoruba town of Imeko a year earlier, putting the captured people into the factories under duress. Hlele may not have been able to go after the Eba city of Abeokuta but he could go after its neighbor, which belonged to a different Yoruba subgroup, the Ketu. The city, like many of the former remnants of the Oyo Empire, was focused on fighting other Yoruba city-states, but it was wary of the Dahomey attacking. Wanting to seize the riches of the city, Hlele created a false flag operation by attacking Mahi again and making a false retreat while spreading the rumor that he had been soundly defeated. This made the leaders of Ketu relaxed and they sent out their forces on their own campaigns. Seizing on the army's absence, Dahomey sacked Ketu in 1883, killing its king and stealing much of its riches, and the army withdrew before the Ketu forces could catch them. Ketu quickly rebuilt and intended to make itself stronger for another Dahomey assault. In 1885, the expected invasion came, but the fortifications made it hard for a direct assault on Ketu by the Dahomey. This changed the conflict from a raid to a siege, which lasted several months. With the Dahomey bringing in cannons to bombard the walls and starve out the citizens of Ketu successfully. Three months after the siege began, the walls broke and the Dahomey forces streamed through and turned the town of Ketu into a ghost city afterwards, rendering it an uninhabited ruin for nearly a decade. Chapter 8 The Franco-Dahomey Wars Clearly, then tried to monopolize trade from one specific European power, France. By this time, France had set up protectorate states in Porto Novo, Cotonou, and Hlele by 1886 had begun raiding near the borders of those protectorates, even capturing indigenous people that waved the French tricolors for protection. The talks with France slowly became more tense, and in 1887, Dahomey soldiers killed Senegalese traders that were officially under the protection of the French Empire. In 1889, an attempt was made to ease tension through trade. France had been officially renting Cotonou from Dahomey, and in November 1889, the French envoys came to discuss the usual 
rent payments. On the side, France had been slowly absorbing more parts of the Dahomey Empire. Alongside the British Empire, stationing its forces in Lagos City and being a huge barrier to Dahomey aggression and any potential aggression into what would become Nigeria. The envoys were met by Clearly's son, Kondo, and the talks did not go well. Kondo spoke loudly to the envoys that the French had been amassing military units in Cotonou, while the envoys retorted that this was logical considering their own subjects were being attacked by Dahomey raiders. It was clear to both parties that war was inevitable, and when Clele passed away on December 29, 1889, Kondo would take the throne in January 1890 and rename himself Behanze. French officers with a large contingent of Senegalese and Gabonese soldiers numbering 299 had the elite Kiraliers push out the Dahomey forces stationed in Cotonou and fortified the town. On February 22nd, Behanze heard of this and made ready for war. The three ralliers were armed with eight-shot repeating rifles, various field guns that fired canister or grape shots. Work was done to set up an 800-meter fortified perimeter around the trading posts. The first battle occurred on March 4, 1890. The Dahomey approached the French forces on a rainy day, attacking with several thousand soldiers and Amazons. The attack started at 5 a.m., with the Amazons attacking one of the log stockades. The Amazons quickly tore apart the stockade and used the gaps as points to fire their musket shots. The Amazons managed to break through to get to the point where they engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand combat range, but were initially repelled by the bayonet rifles, with many of the women being speared by the bayonets. The chief gunner of the fort was killed by an Amazon, along with a Senegalese corporal and several Gabonese soldiers that had tried to disarm the Amazons of both their ranged and close combat weapons, only to be caught off guard as some of the Amazons fought with sharpened nails, ripping out the throats of the Gabonese soldiers. The rest of the army broke through the defenses, the numerical superiority only being halted by additional fortifications. Two hours into the battle, a French gunboat came at the port and began firing at the Dahomey forces, which they had no response to. Their only objective was to capture the well-defended forts, and after two more hours, the Dahomey retreated, having lost 120 soldiers, while the French lost eight and had 20 wounded. The French quickly repaired the damages and made plans to pursue the Dahomey, learning from their intelligence that the Dahomey were setting their sights on the village of Achupa, which was a short distance from Porto Novo. Bringing in French marines, disciplinaires, and 500 soldiers provided by King Tofa of Porto Novo, the French met the Dahomey on April 20th, 1890, at Achupa. 
Tophus soldiers engaged the Dahomean forces in a delaying tactic, allowing the French to bring in their marines and field guns. The Dahomean troops were able to kill a prince of Porto Novo during the battle, which caused the forces to waver and retreat. The Dahomey troops threatened to encircle the French forces and wipe them out. But the Senegalese forces charged the Dahomey, thus allowing the French to form a defensive square. Though both sides had firearms, the deciding factor was range and gun quality. Dahomey guns were muzzle-loaded and had a range of 100 yards. The French had the 8-shot repeating rifle and a range of 300 yards, meaning the Dahomey forces needed to get in much closer in order to get a shot, and the reload time was much longer for them. The Dahomey, through sheer numbers, were able to push the French back towards Porto Novo, but due to the square formation, the numbers were being shredded as the French beat a slow strategic retreat towards the city, firing steadily while marching in reverse. Of the forces that actually managed to reach the French square formation, it was only the Amazons that got close. Getting into hand-to-hand -hand combat range, when their rifle shots were expended. Like at Cotonou, they were sliced apart by bayonets, and by 10 a.m., the Dahomey beat a retreat. 57 French units wounded, and 8 Porto Novans dead. Seeing the results of the more advanced French weaponry, Behanzen signed a tense peace treaty with France on October 3, 1890, which recognized Cotonou as a French protectorate, and Behanzen would still receive rent payments. Both sides were aware that this peace would not last, as several territories in the Dahomey Kingdom were flocking to the French banner as protection from raids. The Hansen then started to make large purchases of field guns, American Winchester carbines, Austrian Mannlichers, Hassepots, machine guns, and Hoop cannons, while the French also expanded their armaments to prepare for what would be called the Second franco dahomey War. In March 1892, Behansen's forces were conducting their old-time raids in Uemet territory. The contention now was that Ueme was considered territory belonging to Porto Novo, and thus this was a violation of the peace agreements. The French gunboat Topaze went upriver to investigate. The Dahomey forces fired on the ship, wounding five of the soldiers. French envoys were sent to Dahomey, but Behansen threatened battle, stating that he was better prepared to fight the French this time. Having seen this as a casus belli, France was able to declare war on Dahomey once again. France had learned its lesson from underestimating the Dahomey in the last war. They brought in Marine Colonel Alfred Amadi Dodds, who brought with him French foreign legionaries, Senegalese Safis cavalrymen, Hausa militiamen, engineers and artillery units, and 2,600 soldiers from Porto Novo. The attack began on June 15, 1892, with French ships blocking the ports to prevent Behansen 
from receiving more arms, shelling several of the coastal areas. By July 4th, the French had secured the coast, moving further inland, determined to conquer Dahomey itself. French forces settled at the village of Dogba on September 14th. Shortly after, a force of 4,000 attacked the encampment. The fighting went on for seven weeks, with 23 separate engagements occurring as the French were slowly pushing the Dahomey forces all the way back to the city of Abomey. But the Battle of Dogba itself lasted for hours, with only five casualties on the French side, but hundreds lay dead on the Dahomey side. Moving 15 miles in the direction of Abomey, the French were attacked at Port Wessa on October 4th. The Dahomey charges would fail against the 20-inch bayonet rifles as the French engaged in their own charges to meet the Dahomey forces. The Hansen then ordered a flank on the house of contingent of the French forces, but were repelled by the Senegalese soldiers. At the end of this battle, the French suffered 42 casualties, with 20 more wounded, and the Dahomey lost 200 of their own. Next target of the French was the city of Kana, 25 miles away, and this time the Hansen and the ruling council of Dahomey realized that fighting the French head-on would not be feasible as a tactic. Thus, they switched to asymmetrical warfare. They would build lots of foxholes, traps, and trenches, and many earthworks to slow the French forces down. This was proving to be more effective at harming the French than the initial pitched battle. By October 6, 1892, the French forces reached the village of Adagon. This was a massive loss for the Dahomey, as they lost a percentage in a large amount of the over 400 Amazons they had stationed there, with only 17 out of the original 400 surviving. The Dahomey Amazons still had the penchant of charging against the French, a tactic proven if ineffective time and time again against the bayonet. Moving forward, after the French victory at Adagon, French forces came across the village of Akba, crushing the Dahomey forces there after battling from October 15th to October 27th. By October 28th, the French had reached the Dahomey trench lines and moved into the trenches to flush out the Dahomey. Amazon troops then circled around the French camp and managed to penetrate deep into enemy lines, outflanking the French. They were only stopped by the Senegalese rear guard, who pushed them back with a successful bayonet charge. Dodd's army finally reached the outskirts of Kana by November 2nd, 1892. While his army had been incurred losses, Steadily along the Dahomey Trail, the losses were still far less severe than what the Dahomey had been enduring. On the outskirts of the city, Mehansen led the charge to defend Kana, but after three days of fighting, the Dahomey forces were pushed back. One thing of note is that the French found that the Dahomey forces had been consuming large amounts of alcohol before the battle, possibly to make themselves more brave and ready for battle. By this point, the only Amazon units left were the elite battle units, named so after their forebears centuries ago. The final battle would take place at the royal palace of the Okue, where the remaining battle Amazons would try to target Dodds and his officers, but to no avail. The fighting will last all day on November 4th, 
but the successful bayonet charge, overrunning the Dahomey at the end, once all munitions fire was exhausted. Two days later, it seemed that Behansen wanted peace, and on November 6th, he sent envoys to negotiate. The peace talks were held in Kana and went on for ten days. But they failed. Now promoted to general, Dodds marched for Abomi on November 16th, forcing Behansen to adopt a scorched earth tactic and burn Abomi to the ground and flee. The palace survived the blaze, and the French placed their flag on the palace on November 17th. While we can state that the French losses were still small compared to the thousands of Dahomey soldiers dead on the ground, in the grandest scale of French colonial campaigns, this was one of the most costly and devastating. Fifty-two soldiers, of which fifteen were officers and thirty-three African units were killed, several heavy artillery destroyed, 224 Europeans wounded, joined by 213 African soldiers, with 173 Europeans and 23 Africans dying of malaria and dysentery. Arriving at the town of Acheri Bay, Behansen tried to muster a force large enough to push out the French forces, having to evade capture by Dodd's army all the while. The French finally caught him in 1894 and exiled him to Martinique. France needed a puppet ruler and afterwards decided to offer it to Behansen's relatives in order to legitimize the rule so they could establish Dahomey as a protectorate kingdom of the French Empire. Most of them refused except for Behansen's cousin, Kuchili, who took the name Agoliagbo. With the king in place, the French got the Dahomey to officially surrender and monitored Agoliagbo's rule until 1900 through French viceroys. When Agoliagbo started to become uncooperative, they exiled him to Gabon, and abolished the monarchy, instead placing French governors. Agoliagbo wouldn't be able to return home until 1910. By 1904, the French renamed the area to French Dahomey, finally ending the three centuries long existence of the kingdom. The French disbanded the Amazon units though they praised them as opponents, writing at length about them. The last Amazon is speculated to have died in 1979, which means she would have lived to see independence from the French. The surviving Amazons would live to see the name change from French Dahomey to the Republic of Dahomey to eventually Benet. Since independence, the royal family of Dahomey still exists and has a ceremonial role with Khele's grandson, Da Sagbaju, as the current monarch. Chapter 9 A Look at the Amazons Now that the history of the kingdom has been covered, we have looked at the first appearance of the Amazons, from the better huntresses to their statuses as Mino warriors. The Amazons themselves are the most enduring legacy of the Dahomey Kingdom. We can see statues, European writings, and even their influence in the comic and hit film Black Panther, with the Dora Milaje of the film confirmed to be based on the Dahomey Amazons. Who were these women? What were their daily lives and regimen like? How were they selected? This final chapter will look at the lives of the Amazons using the information found in the book 
Amazons of Black Sparta by Stanley B. Alpern. What contemporary writers noted about the women of Dahomey was their physique. Even for those that had just begun their training, Richard Burton, who visited the homie during Hele's rule, wrote a statement which declared that the women of the homie appeared to be the physical equal of the men, since they all did the same labors as their male counterparts. But if that is the case, why did other women of the Niger Delta region also not become warriors as well? since they also seem to share the physique potential, according to Burton. The difference is the culture of Dahomey. Dahomey was an empire that was aggressive, constantly going on raids, which meant a constant stream of conflict. The previous military disasters, as noted in chapters before this one, meant that the male population was rapidly dwindling, both from war and consistently selling young men into the slave trade. This forced Dahomey to recruit the better huntresses and turn them into the Mino in order to maintain their stability as a raiding nation. By 1862, visitors would note that the population dynamics of Dahomey were heavily skewed in favor of women especially towards the last decades of the Dahomey Kingdom, which was hemorrhaging men by the thousands. Recruitment of the Amazons varied based on the territories of the Empire. Ostensibly, in Dahomean tradition, an unmarried woman could become the king's consort. A recruiting official called a Pakba would tour the kingdom making a record of the women present. Beautiful women would be assigned to be transferred to the king's bedchamber. More stocky women would be recruited for the palace guard. Women who committed crimes would also become part of the palace guard as punishment. Among the noble families, they would send some of their daughters to the palace in order to increase their favor with the king who would reward them with slaves and a share in the slave trade itself. Although many of these women would be stated to be the royal wives of Dahomey, few of them rarely were bedded by the king, instead just living in the palace doing several roles, but mainly training to become guards for the king. Some of the women trained to be Amazons came from slave raids, those were selected by some kings more favorably, as they were assumed to have no political ties to the various Dahomey noble houses. The Ahua Nato regiment of the Dahomey forces was made up of the descendants of Dahomey kings. As noted from a Hangbei's tenure as both princess and queen of Dahomey, princesses were expected and encouraged to have many lovers and birth many children. Many of these princesses were going to become Amazons themselves, becoming an elite regiment in battle. Some Amazons would go on to have children of their own, whether from a prior marriage or otherwise, dispelling the myths that all Amazons were celibate except the king. One method that the king used to ensure that some Amazons would be celibate was to have a lot of them go through female circumcision. But as the decades went on, and the male soldiery declined in numbers, celibacy became untenable and impractical, and they were encouraged to be fruitful and multiply in order to produce more troops. Also ending was the practice of punishing Amazons for getting pregnant, which was more common during Clele's rule. Some women willingly joined the ranks of Amazons, as that afforded them a better social life and treatment for men. The Dahomey Kingdom had no beasts of burden, stymied by the existence of the Seisei fly. So a lot of the heavy-duty work 
had to be done by hand. Becoming an Amazon afforded you respect, your own slaves, and access to a lot more riches, especially the security of the palace. As an Amazon, they were treated second only to the king in terms of importance. As far as military attire went, prior to Hezo's reign, there wasn't a military uniform. But soldiers and Amazons were in their own personal vestments. Trade with Brazil and observation of European military attire changed that, as both men and women started wearing knee-length shorts called chocotos and wearing headgear. Both units would be topless until the 1840s when both units started wearing loose sleeveless shirts. The headgear was made of a white cotton skull cap, sometimes with embroidery resembling a crocodile for veteran units. Newer units wore headbands instead. Amazon uniforms came in two colors. The one for battle was darker in color with shades of dark blue, rust brown, with grey thrown in. Ceremonial attire weave the colours of scarlet green and pale blue. The more ceremonial attire contains silks, velvet, chintzes, and cottons from India that have been procured through the Trans-Saharan trade network. High-ranking officers wore red berets or silver helmets with gold trims woven into their shirts. Attached to their headgear were small silver horns for officers and gold horns for higher rank. Most Amazons cut their hair very low or completely shaved their head. Higher-ranking combatants often dyed their hair indigo to help stand out for easy recognition. Eyewitness accounts state that some veteran Amazons wore amulets or charms intended to grant them further success in battle. The typical amulet of the Amazons was a smooth bore muzzle loaded flintlock musket. This model had a 38 inch barrel closed and welded by a plug, and secured by pins. Amazons also used carbines and blunderbusses. As noted in their war against the French, these firearms had a limited range, which is why the Amazons often charged into close-quarters combat. The repertoire of guns would not be upgraded significantly until Behansen's reign. Amazon forces also used cannons, swivel guns, and mortars, which were very effective in sieges. For close combat, the Amazons used a variant of the machete. It was broad and slightly curved, with a guard-free hilt similar to a cutlass. They also wore daggers, a leftover from the early battle days. They would attach some of these knives to their guns, in imitation of the bayonets, that would be their downfall. One of the more unique swords was one that resembled a giant razor. The blade was 30 inches long, weighed 30 pounds with a wooden handle with a straight edge. The blade was a two-handed weapon and was given to the more elite units, and European observers nicknamed them portable guillotines. One-handed axes were not uncommon in the hands of generals, along with short truncheon clubs. Younger Amazons were trained in the bow and arrow, and the use of poison-tipped arrows in combat, to be used as shock troops with their additional brass spears. This light weaponry allowed them to be used as scouts, spies, and assassins more effectively, though someone reported to also use slingshots dipped in poisons that could seep into the skin. Amazons often started their training from a very young age, from as young as 8 to 10, to mold them in 
being devoted to the life of a warrior, which is why they were often compared to the ancient Spartans. Observers noted that the Amazons would engage in mock battles to practice formations and tactics, engaging in daily shooting practices to improve accuracy. Wrestling was also an important part of training, with the final exam of sorts being a pinning of larger male opponents. The intense training they received was meant to make them much stronger than their fellow male soldiers, and trained to receive a lot more damage and punishment, and shrug it off. There was also psychological training, called insensitivity training. This was meant to make them numb to the pain or suffering of others, and have no hesitation when it came to killing people. They would be instructed to kill prisoners and criminals, with the instructors making sure the Amazons made a swift clean kill and not be afraid of death. There were also non-combatant roles for the Amazons. There were Amazon singers, dancers, and musicians that would appear on the battlefield to bolster the morale of the troops. When the Amazons were not at war, they were also artisans, often making pottery, palm oil, textiles, and doing some farm. When it came to battle formations, the standard practice was to have the male warriors be divided into right and left wings, with Amazon units on either side at the edge, forming wing extensions. The Dahomey liked to attack at dawn, liking to surprise the enemy, or lull them into false senses of security. They would also go after the religious items of the enemy in order to break morale. The main objective was usually not to kill, but rather capture the enemy for their slave raids, which is why town or village encirclement was a common tactic in order to prevent escape. Whenever an Amazon fell in battle, they would usually be given full honors by the king. If an Amazon was captured, they tended to try and commit suicide rather than give up information. This painted the picture of an intense warrior culture, making them the fascination of European explorers the world over. It is thanks to these explorers that we have documentation from pre-colonial times, since a lot of documentation that was in Dahomey did not survive the multiple sackings by the Oyo and the burning of the city during the Second Dahomey-Franco War or Franco de Homie War if you're so inclined. The Amazons themselves may be decades dead, but they are still featured in a lot of modern media and pop culture, so they endure, not just in Benet, but the world over. This was a long series to make, but I was happy to make it. I hope you enjoyed this series on the Dahomey. As per usual, we will be looking at myths next. This time, we will be looking at myths from Togo. We will be moving across West Africa, then loop back around. This will allow me to not give too much favoritism to a specific country or tribe, and effectively cover more history. This gives me a chance to learn with you, the listener, to part of African history not often spoken of. Though we will get to famous things like the Enri, the Arachuku, the Mali Empire, the Songhai, its lesser kingdoms like Wolof jo or Jolof and others which also need to be addressed as they were a large part of history too. Thank you for listening. This is Afrostorian. Like, comment, subscribe. And I would love to hear your history and myth suggestions for future West African topics. For now, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode where we look at the myths from the airway people who live in both Togo and Ghana.